So uh, first of all, um, I'm uh, Zhu Chen. Um, I'm a professor of finance at the uh, Faculty of Business and Economics at the University of Hong Kong, uh, also director of the Asia Global Institute. Uh, welcome to all of you uh, to join this uh, special joint event uh, between the Quantitative Histories webinar series and the Economic History of Developing Regions virtual seminar series. Uh, by way of background, uh, the International Society for Quantitative History uh, was uh, founded by me together with uh, Professors uh, Derby Ma and uh, James Kuhn and also Chi Chen Ma, uh, most of whom are at the University of uh, Hong Kong. Uh, the main goal is really to promote uh, the use of quantitative methods uh, in research, uh, for research on economic and uh, other historical topics. Uh, so this is why uh, about three months ago, uh, we started this uh, webinar series uh, with the purpose again of um, reaching out to as many of you as we can uh, to show the latest uh, research in economic history as well as other histories. So before I uh, use up all the introduc introduction time, let me uh, invite a Professor uh, James Fensky of uh, uh, the University of Warwick. He is the organizer of the um, Economic History of Developing Regions uh, virtual seminar series. Uh, James, you want to say a few words? Right. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I'm one of the co-organizers of the Economic History of Developing Regions seminar. We are in conjunction with the Economic History Society of Southern Africa and the journal of the same name, trying to give a platform for scholars based in developing countries and working on economic history to be able to present their work. In the next uh, month or so, we'll have Guillermo Lambe from the University of Brasilia and Calumet Links from Stellenbosch presenting. If you want to be on our email list, just send me an email and I will include you in future updates. Okay, yeah, thank you, uh, James. Uh, so uh, today we're really uh, very thrilled uh, to have uh, Professor uh, Mark Koyama from, the, uh, from George Mason University. I uh, especially also want to uh, say sorry to those of you uh, who live in the uh, Far East uh, because now it's uh, after 9 p.m. Uh, in the greater China region or maybe even later if you are in uh, Japan or South Korea, uh, because we have to, we had to uh, try to uh, fit uh, the different time zones in Asia, Europe, and North America. So this is why we also particularly appreciate uh, Mark's willingness to get up so early and uh, give this talk to fit all of our schedules. So his uh, talk uh, is on fractured land and political uh, fragmentation. So Mark, uh, so you can talk for an hour and then uh, let's uh, uh, reserve all the Q and A's and comments uh, to after Mark's uh, uh, presentation. So Mark, here you go. Thank you. So let me um, share my screen. Um, Thanks for the introduction to both Zui and, um, and James. It's very kind. Me, uh, should have been on top of this share screen. So today I'm talking about the fracture land hypothesis. So this is joint work with um, Jesus Fernandez Villaverde, uh, Yu Hong Lin, and uh, Ton Hui Singh. So let me get straight into it. The research question we have in this paper is what drives persistent differences in a pattern of political centralization and fragmentation over recorded history. So um, what I'm showing you here, I'm replicating a figure from um, an earlier paper I wrote with Ton Hui Singh and uh, Yu Ko, um, comparing the number of distinct sovereign regimes in China and Europe. Uh, note the scale is, is essentially a, a log scale. China has been either centralized 
or split into a small number of kingdoms throughout its entire history. This goes back to uh, zero CE, but you could extend this back further. Europe, with the exception of the Roman period, has been increasingly fragmented over time. And um, I would say this is a very conservative estimate of a number of sovereign states in Europe coming from Nusli. You could have um, a, a, um, a more a richer definition of sovereign states, including say the states within the Holy Roman Empire, and this picture will just be even stronger, even more exaggerated. There'll be even more states in Europe. And so why is this the case? And, and more generally, what explains patterns of political fragmentation and centralization across uh, the pre-industrial world, particularly across um, Eurasia? So Arndt is going to have something to do with fractured land, but before I get there, I should justify you know, what the question, why do we care as either economists or economic historians or quantitative histories, historians? So the first kind of most important reason for why we might care about this is that political fragmentation is seen as crucial to the great divergence. So going back to Montesquieu and actually um, perhaps to Hume, polycentric state systems have been um, seen as a source of kind of European growth and vitality. So the medi medieval Europe was very fragmented and a lot of scholars have seen this as kind of key to, key to economic growth. This, this argument was made kind of in modern times by Eric Jones and it's been revived, I would say, in two important recent works. Um, Joel McKeer's A Culture of Growth, 2016, really makes the case that innovation takes off partly because you have a fragmented state system. And he actually makes an explicit contrast with, with China. And then Walter Schadel has a fantastic new book called Escape from Rome, which makes, similarly makes the case, but it's only because Europe escaped the fate of being under a centralized empire, but it could, it could grow. Uh, nonetheless, so there's this big literature which we're citing here, and there are different aspects of it explored by different authors, looking at taxation, innovation, state capacity. Um, we're not going to go into details about the link to growth in this paper. And I would say that even if you're skeptical of this argument, even if you don't think the polycentric state system was the key to the great divergence, nonetheless, it's a really interesting um, fact about history, feature of a world that we would want to understand. So what explains this, this divergence? What explains these different patterns of, of state formation? So again, the argument goes back a long way, perhaps to David Hume, but it was made very famous by Jared Diamond um, in, in the late 1990s. And he, he made the case that fractured land, so fractured land refers to the presence of mountain barriers, dense forests, rugged terrain, impeded the formation of large empires in Europe in comparison with other parts of East Asia, or Eurasia rather. So for instance, if you um, look at a map of Europe, Mountains such as the Alps and the Pyrenees naturally seem to divide off the Iberian Peninsula from France, France from Italy, uh, and so on. And the English Channel divides the British Isles from continental Europe. So this is a plausible idea. It's a qualitative, a qualitatively stated by Diamond, and it seems plausible. However, it's not uncontested. So um, Philip Hoffman, in his 2015 book, noted that on average, China is considerably more mountainous than Europe, more rugged. Similarly, um, Peter Turchin and, and Tanner Greer, both in actually blog form, made a similar argument. They observed that if geography was all there is, then you might expect there to be um, a large uh, state across the, the Western European plain, for example. Um, so they, they also contested Diamond's argument. And uh, Hui, in a 2005 book, uh, looking at the um, the warring states period in China and comparing it to early modern Europe said that essentially this is a contingent outcome. History is a product of somewhat, you know, a, a, a series of events, some of which are random. And so the fact that China happens to be centralized could be a contingent outcome. And a warring states period could have ended differently. And we shouldn't be deterministic, especially we can't have a static um, explanation for a dynamic contingent outcome. Um, so we're going to reassess the fraction land hypothesis. So far, these arguments have all been qualitative, and we're going to try and assess it quantitatively. We're going to bring a formal model and kind of new data to assess this question. And this is going to be crucial because why why do we want, why do we have to be quantitative? We want to say how not just did geography matter or did fractured land matter. We want to be able to say how much did it matter. 
So that question, how much, is going to require a quantification. So specifically, in our investigation, we're going to build a dynamic spatial model of state formation, which I'll explain um, later. And our focus is going to be on Eurasia. So we're not just going to compare China and Europe. China and Europe are going to be at two ends of, of Eurasia. Um, we're going to benchmark ourselves trying to explain the divergence in those two parts of, uh, of Eurasia. But we're actually interested in the whole of Eurasia. And our, our time frame, we, we, we think of as being approximately from the end of the Iron Age to just on the eve of the uh, age of European explorations, the age of discovery. So think about the 2,500 years, which span 1,000 BC to 1,500 C, as being the main period of investigation. Once you get to the world of, of, of Columbus and, uh, and transatlantic uh, kind of commerce, then our model is going to be less, increasingly less relevant. And it's not relevant to the age of modern technology. So this is a model which explains pre-industrial pre divergences in state formation. Um, our approach is to divide Eurasia into small grid cells and provide each cell with rich kind of geographical, topographical, climatic um, and, um, information, and this information on, its, on the productivity of its land. And then we're going to allow these cells to engage in stochastic warfare with each other. And that's going to lead to polities consolidating and then fragmenting. And the process of state formation in this model is going to be mediated by the characteristics of each cell. We're going to simulate this model and obtain probability, probability distributions over the different outcomes of the state systems. And this will become very clear once I show you the visual um, kind of realizations of the model. Our results, just to give you the preview, we're going to find that fractional land is a very robust explanation for political divergence at either end of Eurasia. It's going to always, in our simulations, we're always going to find China unifying and Europe being fragmented. I should note at this point that for us, it's not enough that Europe's fragmented. If Europe was fragmented into 100 or 200 or 300 tiny states, that would not resemble uh, what we observe historically. What we're going to find um, is a Europe divided into me medium-sized states, which is precisely what historians like Chadel argue was kind of key to, to the European um, divergence. In our model, there are going to be two sufficient mechanisms for this outcome. So you just need one of these, and you're going to get a fragmented Europe and a, and a divided China. One is topography. So it's going to matter not how mountainous Europe is, but the location of the mountains. Res precisely the location of the mountains with respect to the productive land. So the location of Europe's mountain ranges and, and rugged ter terrain in general divide Europe into several geographical cores, which can provide a nuclei for different European states. In contrast, China is on average more mountainous, but the location of the mountains in a rugged area matters. And it's going to, the, the, the main feature of Chinese state formation, which is well established by, by historians of China, which is not, not, not new, is that the vast kind of, vast but very productive plain between the Yangtze and the Yellow River is going to give, a, give rise to a sufficiently productive core geographical region, which then has the resources to um, invade and conquer other parts of China. Another, so, so just topography alone can generate this. The other sufficient mechanism is going to be productive land. And that's going to be, so that's, I think I've already alluded to, I've already stated this. It's for, for the fact that the, the Northern Chinese Plain is very productive and the lack of a, a, a similarly dominant core region of very high land productivity in Europe is going to be another feature which is going to be sufficient to drive this divergence. So to, to, in order to neutralize our results, in order to get Europe centralizing at the same pace as China, or China remaining as fragmented as Europe, you're going to need to turn off both topography and productive agriculture. Then you're going to get the, a very different pattern from what we see historically. And as I'll show you in the, in the presentation, a robust range of, um, sorry, a range of robustness tests are going to confirm our main findings. I mean, briefly, um, there's a huge literature we're contributing to. I'll just pick out a few, um, a few of the highlights here. I've, I've talked about Makia already and Chidel's book. I should just note that this is an old hypothesis, but it's, it's one which has never been formalized and never formally tested before. 
Um, the one er other area of research I want to touch on is the role of a step. So uh, with Tonal Hui Singh and Ju Ko, I've previously published a paper on the step. Uh, this is a feature which has been pointed to by a range of scholars, including uh, uh, James Kung and Ying Bai and Peter Turchin. So the step is, a, is, is another possible uh, factor explaining uh, differential state formation in Europe and China. And we, we're going to be able to um, accommodate the world of a step as one of our robustness checks. Um, finally, I'll just note on this slide that we're not saying other factors don't matter. So institutions and culture plausibly matter for this result as well. In some sense, political centralization and unification may be overdetermined. So here, we're not saying these other factors don't matter. We're just looking for a minimal set of driving uh, factors which can account for what we observe historically. And these could interact with institutions and culture, with religion, with other factors which we're interested in. It's just we're not going to be focusing on those cultural institutional uh, factors in this particular paper. But they could plausibly be very important. Okay, so let me state the fractured land hypothesis for the, the, you know, everyone's benefit. This is just from Jared Diamond, and I'll read out the quote. Diamond says, the ultimate reason for Europe's political fragmentation is evident just from glancing at a map of Europe. You have a very fractured coastline, so highly indented coastline, high mountains and a dense forest, which divide Europe into many peninsulas, islands, and geographical regions, each of which developed political, linguistical, ethnic, and cultural autonomy. Each such region became one more natural experiment in the evolution of technology and scientific inquiry, competing against other regions. Conversely, China has a much less indented coastline, no islands large enough to achieve autonomy, and less formidable mountain barriers. Um, so essentially, there are islands, obviously, in, in, in East Asia, but Taiwan, and then especially Japan, are sufficiently far away from mainland China, that they, and, they're not, and Taiwan is not large enough to have the same kind of in, um, effect that the British Isles has on continental Europe. And the Chinese coastline looks, looks less um, indented. But Diamond is essentially, um, incorrect or mistakes some of those, some of the geographical features about China and Europe. Here we're just reproducing a map of ruggedness from our paper and it confirms the criticism of Phil Hoffman um, that China is actually significantly more rugged and mountainous than Europe. So um, if it's just as, as, as Diamond says, the, the, the fact that you're more or less mountainous, then you'd expect Europe to have a centralized state and, and not China. Um, but of course, as I've already uh, suggested, what's going to matter is not the fact of how mountainous you are, it's going to be the location of these mountains relative to uh, productive land that we think is the best way to reformulate the fractional land hypothesis um, in a more, um, to, to make it more, uh, more in line with what we're going to observe. Okay, so we're going to formalize this, more, this, 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 um, this argument now in a, in, a, in a model, and I'll just go through the steps of a model um, slowly, hopefully. The model is actually quite simple. It's based on random contest functions. So we're, we're abstracting away from strategic decision-making by policies uh, in, order to, in order to kind of zoom out and take a, take a very abstract and big picture view of, of this question. So we're going to divide the world into more than 20,000 hexagons of a with a radius of 28 kilometers. So why, why hexagons? Well, hexagons are a natural timing of the Euclidean space. So, you know, in some sense, we, you know, the natural way to think about political authorities, it might emanate out um, in a circle, but of course, if you're trying to map across Euclidean space, you, you, you don't want to leave areas uncovered. So this is why we're going to use hexagons. Um, 28 kilometers, so these are very small. The reason for this is we're beginning our simulation as I said, in the early Iron Age. So think about the world in 1000 BCE, this is a world of small tribes, small groups of people. They're going to only be able to extend authority over a very small radius. 28 kilometers is roughly how long um, people can walk, an average person, an average healthy adult can walk in a day. So these are very small polities we're beginning with. And we're going to, so we're going to assume a world where states or 
states, states don't exist, and political authority is extremely decentralized. And we go, that's where we go begin. So each of these 20, 000, more than 20,000 hexagons is initially modeled to be an independent polity. And over time, they're going to stochastically engage in conflict. Um, the probability of conflict depends on their underlying characteristics, specifically their probability, as you'll see uh, when I get there. Um, the idea here being is if there are more resources, if there's more stuff to fight over, conflict becomes more likely. So you get conflict along the borders of these hexagonal, hexagonal, hexagonals, hexagons rather. Um, and these conflicts uh, are going to be between, uh, as state formation happens, um, one hexa hexagon will conquer another and a polity of more than one hexagon will form. And so you're going to get larger states fighting. And in, vict in war, victory will depend on how many resources that polity controls. So how many hexagons it controls, is, controls and how productive they are and on the geographical characteristics of the cells in conflict. Specifically, rugged terrain, forests, uh, the presence of desert or of the sea lane are going to affect conflict. They're going to make it harder to conquer a specific region. They're going to make it more likely that no annexation takes place. Finally, there's going to be the possibility of secession. So as this model takes place, polity is going to conquer larger and larger um, areas of land. They're going to have more hexagons in their, in, within their, their state. But there's going to be every, every period some probability of secession. Probability of secession is going to depend both on the presence of natural obstacles. So the idea here is, uh, as many scholars such as James Scott have, have alluded to, the presence of mountains or forests allows people to escape from the authority of a centralized state. And it's also going to depend on the size and shape of ruling polities. So if you're uh, a peripheral um, hexagon within a large polity, you might be more likely to secede. So what will this look like? Well, suppose your polity K, these are your six adjacent cells. Now every period, there's some probability that you'll be in conflict along one of those borders. You can be in, conf um, in multiple conflicts, and as I'll say, you'll divide your resources proportionally according to the resources of the other cells you're fighting. But this is cell K, and so some, some period it's going to be, uh, there'll be a conflict along, along a border. No, hexagons are preferred unit of analysis, but we also conducted an analysis using uh, square grid cells as well. And we could do robustness with the size of the grid cells. None of that's going to matter for our overall results, but it's the hexagons which give us what we think of as like the best, most accurate simulations. So the key variables in the model, each cell K will be characterized by its spatial location, its productivity, and its geographical attributes. In our baseline, we measure productivity using an estimate um, provided by Goldwick um, of population in zero CE. So this is given for the whole of Eurasia and at a very uh, fine level of analysis. Uh, but none of our results will hinge upon that. Um, we also use agricultural suitability from Raman Kuti, and we use Oded Galore and Omar Ozak's measure of potential calorific yield. So here, in, in all three measures, the motivation is Malthusian. In the Malthusian world, essentially the characteristics of a land are going to give rise to kind of larger populations. So we sh it's, it's natural given the world is roughly Malthusian, but we're gonna get similar results using either a mention, me measure of estimated population or measures of soil suitability or calorific yield. Um, the key geographical variables we have are ruggedness, whether a cell is a sea channel, that's gonna matter because it's gonna allow England to be um, in conflict with say France, whether a cell is frigid, which is measured as below freezing for six months of a year in um, 8,000 BC, whether it's very, to it's torrid, so very hot, like a desert, and whether it's, whether it's characterized by part of the, um, whether, it, whether it's like heavily forested. And as well, as I'll probably mention as we go along, the dense forest of northern, central northern Eastern Europe was actually a major factor in impeding state development in ancient times. So that's another factor we're going to, um, have in our model. Now, we could include more. 
This is deliberately simple. So we want to have a minimal set of characteristics that can explain uh, the, the different features of state formation in the, in the kind of pre-industrial world. So the fact that we, we only have a few variables here is to our advantage, it's not a disadvantage in our, in our assessment. Okay, so I mentioned cells can come into conflict with each other. How does that conflict play out? Well, it's determined by a random contest success function. So here we have the, um, the total productivity of all the cells controlled by productivity I um, as capital YI, that's the sum of the productivity of that polity. And whether or not polity I wins in this conflict, it's going to depend on that relative, relative to the productivity of the cells controlled by polity J and the geographical features of a cell it's fighting over. So these geographical characteristics of a cell, i.e. if it's more rugged, if it's a forest, if it's frigid, are going to make conquest less likely and make it more likely that you, you, your, 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 the conflict results in uh, no annexation. And we're going to simulate this model in R. So here's an example of a war between two policies. Polity I is in red, and polity J is in blue. So you can see here that polity I controls six cells, polity J controls three cells, and they're fighting over the border between cell K and cell K bar. And so who, what, what will determine the outcome of this um, battle? So whether or not I annex K bar or J annexes K, or maybe there's no annexation at all. That's going to de depend on the total resources controlled by polities I and J. So that is to say how productive of these cells controlled by, by I compared to the blue cells controlled by J. And it's going to depend on the geographical characteristics of K and K bar. So the more rugged those are, for example, the less likely it is that this war will result in annexation. So if you want an empirical example, think about Afghanistan. Afghanistan is very, very rugged. And in history, it's rarely been conquered, successfully annexed by any power. Okay, so this looks a little bit more complicated, but the intuition is similarly simple, secession. So at any time period, there's a probability that a border region. So if you're in the interior, of, of, an, of an empire, of a, of a polity, we, we, we assume you, you're, not, you're, you're not going to secede. So in some sense, in a Roman Empire, Italy is not going to secede, but Britain might. So some border regions might secede. And so it's a probability of secession, um, and that's determined by beta, in effect. So beta, we're going to set beta to a particular parameter value, and this is going to determine the probability of secession. And that's only for border regions, and it's increasing in the geographical characteristics of a cell. So more rugged or more forested um, cells are going to have a higher probability of secession. As I said, this is based on kind of a scholarship of historians like James Scott, who say that people can flee to the hills. So if you don't like the government, if you don't like paying taxes, you flee to the mountains. So Switzerland, for example, was able to be more independent of the Holy Roman Empire because of its mountainous terrain. Similarly, um, the, the probability of secession increases as you get larger. So as a parent regime controls more, more cells, we're assuming it's in some sense more heterogeneous, and that's gonna make it more likely to, to secede. Similarly, if a, if a regime J has a long frontier relative to its interior, it's going to be more likely to secede. We're going to, as I will discuss in a calibration exercise, we're going to set beta to be quite low because what, What's going to happen in our simulation is that in Europe, there's going, we're going to, we don't want to bias us against finding a European empire. So we're going to need to set beta quite low in order to make it more difficult for us to find fragmentation in Europe. Okay, so before I get to the calibration, I'll talk about the, I'll summarize the model by discussing the timing. So at the beginning of the, of the, of the simulation, there are going to be, as I said, more than 20,000 independent polities. At any period, there's going to be a probability of conflict breaking out. This will depend on alpha. So alpha is a parameter which 
uh, mediates productivity to a probability of conflict. Um, if there's a conflict, it's going to only it's going to be on one border region. So that's there's going to be some probability that this conflict arises. Depend, and we're, we're going to know, we're going to find out what probability. Let's go determine what border the conflict is on. That's going to result in a war, and that war can result according to the, the equation I showed you earlier, equation one, the contest success function, that war can result in annexation of the cell by I, annexation of the other cell by J, or no annexation. You can have multiple wars in any period, in which case the, region, the, the regime fighting multiple wars will split its resources proportionally according to the resources of its adversaries, and there's a probability of secession given by the equation two on a previous slide. Okay, so before I show you um, all, of the, um, all of the outcomes, let me just show you the map of estimated population in, um, in um, zero C. So this is gonna be our benchmark measure of productivity and dark means lower productivity, light means higher. So you can see that there are gonna be areas in our model which are gonna be unlikely to generate large scale states. Um, so, for example, the jungle of Southeast Asia is going to be less likely to generate large states than is the plain of northern China. Similarly, Europe is quite highly populated, has quite highly productive land in comparison with Siberia, the Gobi Desert, or the deserts of Arabia. And as I'll discuss in the extensions of a the model, there's some things here which we might want to you know, change to replicate specific historical events, which maybe our model doesn't capture, such as the rise of Islamic empires from the Middle East. And then this is our measure of ruggedness. So this is show showing you rugged terrain. And you can see that on average, China has quite a lot of rugged terrain, but the location of the mountains in China is maybe less central than it is in Europe. And we'll discuss that when I get to the results. Okay, so the calibration of a model First, we're going to fit the time, fit the start point and end point of, of the timing of the model. So we're going to have 500 periods in this model. And given we think about this, think about, we're thinking about the supply most of a pre-industrial world in, in, in roughly say 1000 BC to a 1500 C, uh, there's a small typo there. You think about each period as being a roughly five year, five year period. And then we're, in order to, fit this model, we're going to have to put parameter values on, on, on our very sparse number of parameters. So particularly alpha and beta, as I said, beta is going to be very low to bias, uh, but to bias us against finding the result we, kind of want to, we, we expect to find of uh, European fragmentation. Alpha is set so that the most productive cell in, in the world has, has a probability one of coming into um, of a, a, a conflict on its borders. And then we also parameterize the territorial, the, the geographical characteristics as follows. Um, and we, we allow for, we make forests significantly less of a barrier than highly rugged terrain or frigid torrid, torrid terrain. And we make sea lanes a barrier. So you can attack across the English Channel, but it's a significant barrier. And our model is going to be robust to, to kind of varying these, these characteristics. Um, I'm going to show you now a video of a simulation, and I, I hope it's going to work on Zoom. This is going to be a, a bit of an experiment. Uh, let's see, it does. So um, this is a, just one simulation. We've run this simulation many times. As you'll expect, each time we get slightly different outcomes when it comes to the specifics, but we're gonna get a robust pattern of, 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 of centralization in China and fragmentation to medium states into Europe. So let me just run this. Um, here we go. So you can see already in this, this iteration, fairly early on, you get recognizably something like China. You also get medium sized states dividing up Europe and our model also applies to the rest of Eurasia. So places like Siberia are extremely fragmented, which resembles what we, what we, we have historically. Whereas here, Northern India sees a formation of a fairly large state. You can think about this as 
something like the Delhi Sultanate, or if you want to consider a slightly later period, the Mughal Empire. Um, and you also get some larger states in the Near East um, and North Africa. But this outcome is, is, these outcomes are somewhat more contingent, whereas the outcome of state centralization in China and fragmentation in Europe, we always observe. So let me go back to the slides. Here we go. Great. Um, so let me walk you through that again, but just in, in pictures. In, in period 10 of our model, so we began with uniform hexagons. In period 10, you get a few tiny polities, like micro polities essentially forming uh, in bits of Europe, bits of China. By period 50, you're getting larger size states. So if you want to parameterize this to the history, you can think about this as kind of, you know, early um, kingdoms in, in, in Europe or, or, or China, perhaps in, in Zhao Dynasty China or Shang Dynasty China. Because even north of China, we'll often see a precocious state formation. And you're getting, you know, medium, like somewhat um, significant policies in Europe. And over time, these are getting larger. So here you have China divided up into, you know, a couple of largish or growing states. The same goes for Europe, but most of the world is still politically fragmented. But as you go on, increasingly you're going to get the, large, the rise of a larger and larger state in northern China, and Europe is going to be divided up into medium-sized states. And as I said, India, we were quite keen that our model also generates patterns of state formation which fit the experience of other parts of Eurasia. India, you're going to get a large state in the north of India in most of our simulations, but that large state in northern India is never going to conquer the entire Indian peninsula, which is indeed the case historically. So no Indian regime prior to a British Raj controlled all of the Indian subcontinent. And so this is by period 300. Now you have a pretty robust Chinese empire and you have a European state, which is recognizably a Spain, a France, here you have a, a hybrid southern German, northern Italian state, perhaps a Poland, a northern German state. And a, uh, interestingly, we have a British Isles, which also controls, yeah, the British Isles there, which controls um, most, of, most of England and, and uh, southern Scotland. Um, no, these outcomes vary from each simulation, and we're never going to replicate the exact historical um, a historical realization. We often get, or sometimes get, what you could think about as like quasi-Carolinian states spanning France and Germany. And this is period 500, the end of the simulation. Okay, so as I think I've said when we talked about those slides, our model allows for historical contingencies. So it responds to the critique that the diamond fracture land hypothesis is static and deterministic. Our model is dynamic and contingent. In some specifications, England is conquered by Europe. Sometimes there's, a, as I said, a Carolinian style kingdom which spans France and Germany. Sometimes France um, and Spain are united, sometimes Italy and Germany. Nevertheless, some outcomes are extremely robust. They're, they occur in every simulation. China always unifies something like China. Europe never becomes a single state or even close to it. It's always fragmented into several medium-sized states and not into tiny polities. And we often see the rise of a large state in Northern India or, or um, as I suggested, which could be the Delhi Sultanate or the Mughal Empire. Other parts of Eurasia tend to be more fragmented and I'll discuss um, some examples of that in the end of a presentation. So this is the benchmark simulation. How do we kind of quantify whether or not our model is successful? Well, you can plot the Herfindahl index here as a measure of unification. And you can see that in our benchmark simulation, China unifies fairly early on. Europe always remains fragmented. Um, now, that's just one simulation. So we replicate this, we can run this many more than 19 times, but here we're showing 19 iterations of our model. And this is the heat map of, a, of the probability distributions of the Herfindahl index. So what you're seeing on the left-hand figure is that China always unifies. The pace of unification is gonna be partly random, partly contingent. So in some simulations, it unifies earlier than in others, but unification always takes place. Similarly in Europe, it always remains fragmented. The degree of fragmentation, again, is somewhat contingent. Sometimes you get it 
more unified than in other cases, but in the majority of the time, it, it never becomes centralized. Uh, uh, I mean, anything like centralized. So you never even get something like the Roman Empire in our simulations. We'll discuss, I'll discuss at the end, what you need to do in our model to get something like the Roman Empire. And our model, yeah, so you get medium-sized states in Europe. Um, so now I'm going to show you some sensitivity analysis. In order to show you sensitivity analysis, I'm going to plot the median of those 19 simulations for each um, sensitivity analysis. So this is the baseline, uh, as we've said, as you now um, kind of, you're now familiar with, China centralizes much earlier than Europe, which never centralizes. That's the baseline of a model I showed you with all of the characteristics we've discussed. Um, now, I, we, we restrict the number, we restrict the geographical characteristics to a minimal set of obstacles. We turn off things like forests and ruggedness, and we see that we still get that pattern of centralization in China and fragmentation in Europe. So it's a little bit different, but it's basically the same picture. So we've turned off um, things like the forest. They don't drive the result. Uh, now, take away all geographical obstacles. So now every cell in the model is identical geographically. So mountains don't make a difference. Uh, forests don't make a difference. Sea lanes don't make a difference. And so now you still get China unifying earlier than Europe. The difference here is that Europe does eventually become fairly unified. So if you turn off every single geographical characteristic, so you, you say, you know, Jared Diamond is, is uh, you know, Jared Diamond's claim that mountains matter is, 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 is rubbish, turn them all off, you will get a, a European empire eventually, but actually the difference in the pace of centralization is still salient. Um, another exercise we can do is to make Europe much more productive early on. So we do that by just artificially doubling Europe's population. So this makes it much more likely that European cells come into conflict with each other. This also generates something closer to an eventual European centralization, but I would emphasize that the difference in the pace of state centralization, empire formation, is still very salient, even when we double Europe's population. This really stacks things in favor of the European empire, yet the European empire still takes a long time to emerge. Um, Similarly, you can now say, no, let's assume that the population density of a land productivity is identical across cells. So there's no advantage to, you know, cells in northern China, which might be highly productive, and actually you get the same result, basically. The only difference is this early period, but you get our baseline result of China making, becoming an empire, Europe doesn't. It's just now we've turned off the high productivity of northern Chinese, the northern Chinese plain, so it's taking a lot longer for the Chinese empire to emerge. Now, this is what you need to do to totally destroy um, the results. So now you say uniform population density and no geographical obstacles. So now we don't get the results we observe historically. If, there's, if geography doesn't matter, if there's no fractured land and the distribution of productive land does not matter, if we study is uniform, then you get this, which is, not what we observe historically. So here you get, you know, China and Europe basically roughly um, performing comparably, at least until very late in the simulation, in terms of state centralization. And you get long periods for which Europe has more of an empire than China does. Uh, so this is obviously not what we get. So what we're saying here is you can undo history, but to undo history, you've got to turn off geography and make all the land uniformly productive. Okay, so that, those are our main sensitivity checks. Uh, now I'll just show you some robustness checks. And these are not going to affect our main results. So um, this is using Ram and Kuti agricultural suitability data. We get similar, similar findings. Um, Europe does eventually become more centralized, but there's still a robust difference in both the pace and the level of state centralization. This is using Ode Galore and Omar Ozak's potential calorific yield. Um, here, um, you're seeing Europe will eventually centralize, but again, this big difference in, in uh, the timing at which we centralize. This is a robustness check where instead of using the 
population of, of instead of measuring land productivity by population in zero C, we're using population in in a thousand BC. Um, it's a different picture, but you're seeing differential outcomes in China and Europe again. Um, and this is using 500 C. So 1000 BC, you really, it's, it's coming much closer to uniform, the assumption of uniform productivity because population is just much more sparse in general. Whereas so we prefer using zero C as a proxy for how productive a land was. And I think that makes more sense from a perspective of Malthusian theory. Um, let me briefly, in the final kind of 10, 15 minutes I have, talk, talk about some, some of the robustness exercises. So a large literature points to a role of step plays. So specifically, scholars such as uh, James Kong and Yingbai and, and myself, Ton Hui Singh and, 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 and Zhu Ko, have argued that step mattered a lot for Chinese state formation. But Peter Turchin and co-authors have, have similarly argued that the step was an engine of state development more generally because of a military advantage that step regimes had. And so in our extension, we basically enable step um, cells to have a military advantage. So this is trying to get at the idea of the Mongols or the Huns because of their horse, their horses, and their horse archers have a military advantage and that can drive step formation, particularly for cells adjacent to a step. Um, we're going to see very similar results to our benchmark. We're also going to allow for rivers. So rivers in our, in our benchmark analysis are not there. And you might think rivers like the Nile or the Thames are crucial for state formation. And, and that's true, they are. They also matter for military purposes. So we're going to allow uh, river cells to both have higher productivity and to be barriers for conquest. So rivers have that dual role. And so I'll show you an extension with rivers and we're gonna get similar results when we include rivers. Uh, next, the Mediterranean is gonna be kind of interesting for us. In our benchmark analysis, as you've seen, we do not generate anything like the Roman Empire. Uh, why is that? Well, there are two reasons why. One of which is the Mediterranean Sea was perhaps more traversable than other seas in the ancient world because it's much calmer than say the Atlantic or the Pacific. And so Mediterranean states can extend empires across the, they can traverse the Mediterranean. So we're going to allow that in an extension and we're going to see what we need to do in order to generate a Mediterranean empire like the Roman empire. Then finally, the final extension will consider allowing for stochastic exogenous shocks. Uh, the idea here is saying, what if there's a, what if there's a little, little ice age? What if the weather gets much colder? What if there's a volcano or a series of earthquakes or flooding? How does that affect state formation? Or some kind of general crisis, like the crisis of a, at the end of a Bronze Age or the so-called crisis of the 17th century. Okay, so this is steps in rivers. Um, I'm not showing you the kind of equations underlying this, but I'm showing you that whatever we do to make step cells more um, effective militarily does not affect the overall patterns we find with state formation in China and Europe. Um, if anything, it makes the fit kind of slightly better. Similarly with rivers, uh, allowing rivers into a model does not decisively change anything. Even so maybe it increases the realism of a model, but it just adds, it also adds just more, more parameters and it doesn't change things. Um, now the Mediterranean Sea is kind of, is a more interesting one. So now we allow the Mediterranean to be essentially like the British Channel, the English Channel, armies can cross from Sicily to Italy, from Greece to Sicily, from Sicily to North Africa, to see if we can generate um, a, Roman, a, Roman, a Roman style empire. And we can over time, gener we never generate a European empire. So the, whatever, whatever we do with Mediterranean doesn't generate a single European state. That's accurate because the Roman Empire did not control all of Europe. It never controlled Northern Germany or Eastern Europe. Um, but we can get a Mediterranean state often, um, although it takes time to emerge. And we get a Mediterranean state specifically when we allow our measure of productivity to be based on population around zero CE. So that's giving Italy, North Africa, and um, that part of the world, relatively high land productivity. And I should note that that matters because 
one of the factors explaining Roman development, according to um, ancient historians, is the, high is the high productivity of land in southern Europe at that time, which was a reflection of climatic conditions. So um, historians like Kyle Harper have shown that the Roman Empire emerged during the so-called Roman Warm Period. And this is a period where temperature was very stable, warm, and um, the rain occurred at the right time in Italy and North Africa. So North Africa was very fertile, the breadbasket of the empire, and the Roman Empire went into decline when this climate optimum um, uh, ended. Oh, so that's a mistake. Go back. So we can generate something like the Roman Empire. On the other hand, um, it doesn't, you know, it takes time to emerge in our, in our simulations. And we should recognize that, as historians like Chadell have noted, the Roman Empire was sui generis. No other stable, long-lasting European empire in all of European history. And the Roman Empire may have uh, developed the idiosyncratic factors, which are not necessarily in our model. Okay, so we also allow for cycles and shocks. So recall in our benchmark simulation, we have 500 periods corresponding to about 2,500 years. Now we extend the periods of a model. So you've got to relax the mapping between historical time and the model. We want to extend the periods of a model to allow for more kind of random events to take place. So we have a one in 1,000 probability of a general shock occurring in this extended version of a model. A general shock you should think of as something like serious climate change. So the little ice age, which takes place in the 17th century, 16th, 17th century in Europe and China could be a general shock. So could the, whatever caused the fall of the Bronze Age in, in around uh, 1200 BC. We also allow for regime specific shocks, which can occur with a one in 300 probability. So regime specific shock could be something like you um, have a totally incompetent emperor or king, or your dynasty dies out for kind of random reasons, or maybe there's a disease epidemic. Um, when you have a general shock, we have every regime with more than 25 cells breaking up. Um, actually, this is, yeah. Uh, whereas a regime specific shock is just that regime which breaks up. So this is just one way of getting at the idea that you can have chance negative shocks can happen. And we, on average, a, a regime specific shock will now happen every 250 years and a general shock on average every thousand years. And so this is what um, patterns of state formation look like in our model with those shocks. So note China in our model, as, as, you, as you know from baseline, always unifies, but now it unifies, but then a shock might occur and that shock will knock it, knock it down and make it fragment. So you generate what are essentially um, dynastic cycles, which of course, as, 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 as people in the audience will well know, a common feature of Chinese history. In Europe, because empire formation is much more dampened, like you don't get big empires, you get many more states, so the, sh the cycles are more dampened as well because these regime-specific shocks do not affect the whole region. If, if you get a bad ruler, a bad king, that doesn't cause the whole of Europe to fragment. It just causes one, one polity to fall. So in Europe, you get dampened cycles in compared to China. Although, as you can see, there's some variation, which is entirely in keeping with what we observe historically. So my final kind of set of slides will be what about state formation across Eurasia? So what's the probability of empires arising in, in other parts of the world? And so we define, we, we have, we define now a large state as, as have it corresponding to a certain number of, 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 of cells. So this is not to be, this is not full unification. This is just a large state. And so in our simulations, what you can see is there's a high probability once a simulation has run for at least like 100, 125 periods, there's a fairly high probability of a large state emerging in China and in South Asia, so India. And you saw that actually in the simulations I showed you. And a large state may occur in Europe, but with lower probability 
and that will occur later. So you can think about that as like the Habsburg Empire or something. Larger states can emerge in Europe, but with lower probability and later in the simulation. Whereas in, in our baseline model, large states never occur in the Middle East or South Asia, okay? And so South Asia, that's mostly right. South Asian states like in Thailand or Cambodia historically were small and weak. That's, that's, that's correct, but there are no, in our baseline, the Middle East doesn't generate powerful empires. And that seems to be at odds with what we observe historically. However, when we include our step extension, so we allow for the step to have an effect, so regions which border the step are militarily more powerful and are more likely to conquer other regions, then you can get the probability of a Middle Eastern empire emerging. And this is in line with what we observe historically. So you have Turkic empires like the Ottomans or the Sijuk Turks who are able to emerge out of steppe regions and conquer the Middle East. And if you read kind of histories of the Middle East, they'll talk about how the steppe is a perennial threat, which is a spur to state formation. Um, so we generate a lot of the empires we observe historically. The only empire we don't really see in our simulations is something like the original Arabic empire emerging out of Arabia in the seventh century. And that is out of our model. One reason it might be out of our model is because the desert in Saudi Arabia gets a very low value of productivity in our model. Um, that may be at odds with what was the case historically if, if trade is, because we don't have trade in our model. If we had trade in our model, then maybe you get these um, uh, oases in the desert, which are more highly productive, and those potentially could generate an Arabian model. Or it could be pointing to the fact that we don't have religion, right? Our model deliberately excludes things like culture and religion. We don't want them here because it would complicate things like crazy. But maybe the success of the seventh century Islamic, Islamic empire is attributable to religion and not to the factors that we focus on in our model, factors which explain almost every other pre-industrial empire, but not the um, seventh century Islamic one. Okay, so final three minutes, I'll go over this very quickly. A final check of our model is China, Ch where, how does China centralize? Historically, China tended to centralize from the north. So the most powerful states historically in China tended to be in the north. Basically, this core region, which was kind of wheat producing, is highly productive. Um, and so it's northern China based on Skinner's macroeconomic regions, and then the lower Yangtze, which is the centers of state development. In our simulations, where do Chinese empires originate? They originate mostly, off, many in the north and west, like many historical Chinese regimes, and some in the lower Yangtze region. They don't originate in the south. So Hong Kong does not conquer northern China in our model, and that fits what we observe historically. And so this table just summarizes those findings. I mean, the, the, the not those findings, but the historical fact that the majority of unifications of China have stemmed from the North. The Ming is the main exception, the Ming are from the, the Low Yangtze. Okay, so let me um, finish and summarize. So in this paper, we've built a simple model of conflict and political competition. In this model, it's spatial, and we explicitly model the role of, role of terrain in mediating conflict. And we use this model to guide our thinking about why Europe remained politically fragmented and why China was historically unified for most of its history. We've also applied this model to the rest of Eurasia. We've thought about state formation in India and in the Middle East. Uh, and the model confirms the importance of geography, but geography alone, um, it's not geography alone, it's geography with the, in conjunction with conflict and geopolitical com competition that explains different paths to state formation on either side of uh, Eurasia. And I think I'm um, just out of time now. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, this is uh, a very interesting uh, model to uh, replicate what has uh, been observed in history. Uh, I just quickly have uh, uh, two simple questions, and then I will turn it over to my colleague, uh, Professor uh, Chi Chen Ma. Um, first, uh, how will uh, military technologies change? I understand your, your first uh, 500 period simulation 
presumably stopped around uh, 1500 uh, CE. So uh, after that, then military technologies uh, started to really change things. Uh, my second quick question is uh, how military uh, alliances, so you don't necessarily have a, a formal empire, but you form uh, organization or uh, military alliances like NATO and so on, uh, that presents sort of another in-between uh, model between total fragmentation and uh, total unification. <laughs> How would that change the uh, simulation uh, evolution, I mean, the outcome uh, evolution from the simulation? So I, I'll take that question briefly. It's a great question. So military technology, the way we can do it in a model is, uh, is affect the contest success function. So we can allow for the probability of a def So for example, you might think certain technologies benefit defenders more than attackers, and we can change those parameters. And we, we do that in an extension. What we um, cannot, so maybe gunpowder, gunpowder weapons maybe make defense more easy than attack potentially. What we do not want to do is really change the military technology of specific regimes. And I think that's okay for the pre-industrial world because um, gun, in Eurasia at least, <laughs> technology spread fairly quickly. So the composite bow or even gunpowder spread from China to Europe very, very quickly. So there are not huge differences in military technology between regimes. That's, but we can, change, we can say in period 200, defense gets stronger than attack. We can do that. Similarly, our step, our step extension, if we give cells next to the step some advantage, that you could think about that as enabling horse cavalry with stirrups or composite bows to have some military advantage. So we could do some things, but it's never going to be fully realistic. Uh, your point about military alliances is well taken. Uh, what I would say is we don't have anything strategic but the interesting thing is, historically, if you look at like the ancient world, for example, formal alliances, of, uh, uh, the world is anarchic. So there are not very many formal organized alliances. So the fact that we can't have them in a model like ours doesn't, to our mind, you know, we don't think we need them. It would be a very different model if you allow strategic decision making and strategic alliances. But we, we, don't, we can't accommodate those in the model. We don't think it's a huge loss because when you look at, the ancient world, you see people betraying their allies all the time. You don't have long-term alliance structures like NATO in, you know, ancient Rome, Roman times. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm certain that uh, some people in Beijing are very curious about how, how long this pattern you just illustrated will actually continue under the, uh, the current empire, whether, uh, anyway, I'm kind of joking, but let me turn it over to uh, Zichen, yeah. Okay, so, thank you, Mark, for a very fascinating presentation and great paper. Uh, so James, do you have any question or comments now? You can take the privilege to ask now before we turn to picking up the question from the audience. Well, I suppose if you'll give me the opportunity. <laughs> this is more abstract. How do you see this paper fitting into the scientific process? That if I think of development of theory, deriving prediction, testing prediction, this is more of a calibration. And so I don't think of it as a test. I'm wondering if you think of your paper as primarily serving to refine theory and clarify what needs to be in the fractured land hypothesis. Um, it's a, as usual, James, it's a good question. <laughs> One I might need to take some time to think about. So. Um, yeah, it's a different methodology. So, and I, I have to credit to my co for like making us think about this uh, carefully. We, you're right, it's not the, the standard applied micro, you know, you have economic theory and we you know, take it to the data and, and do hypothesis testing. It's, you're right, it's, it's using the history to inform form the theory almost. So it's, it's definitely a different, um, different approach. And I, I think it's something we've been, I mean, it's, it's, it's taken us a long time to write this paper, partly because of uh, the simulations are quite time intensive and partly because we're thinking about how best to present it. It's a different paper. It's a different paper than what we, what we normally see in, in, in econ history, for sure. 
Um, so I'd have to think more about it. But I, I definitely, certainly my conversations with, with my co-authors, especially, so Hezis Fernandez Villaverde is a macroeconomist. So he's used to thinking about calibrations to some degree and how to present them rhetorically as opposed to the standard hypothesis testing approach we have. But I've, I'm kind of methodologically eclectic. I, I, I kind of like to think about things in different ways. So, you know, I have some papers which are uh, standard ones and others which are more narrative ones and more model ones. So I enjoy thinking about the different ways to, to kind of do economic history. Okay, any more question, James? Okay, then I will uh, pick up some questions for you, Mark, from the audience. I'm sure. Uh, one ask uh, about an extension of this research. Uh, can you replicate this in Africa? Uh, uh, I know you don't have the population density map, but agricultural suitability and ruggedness are actually available for, for, the, for the whole world. Yeah, so um, maybe someone will make us do this at some point. We, we have been suggested, it's been suggested to us to do extensions for other parts of the world. What I would say is we haven't done them, so we, but we could potentially. We don't necessarily want to do them, but, uh, but they are available for the whole world. What I would say is if you look at Africa historically, Sub-Saharan Africa, firstly, I don't think we have as good a gauge of locations of, of, of historical kingdoms and empires, but in general, there are only a few uh, Sub-Saharan African empires that, that, that kind of a big, like in Mali, in Ghana, there are some, but they're not very many. So in general, uh, for whatever reason in Africa, there are, there's not very much state formation in the, in his, in the pre-industrial period. And I, I would hedge, without running the simulations, without having explored this, I would hedge that Marcella Alassane's paper on the Tetsi fly could be a reason why. So Africa has some disadvantages in terms of state formation anyway, it's, but the additional worst disadvantage is the disease environment. So the disease environment, uh, the tetsi fly in particular, kills cattle, and cattle are important kind of sources of capital. So in her paper, she shows that the tetsi fly is associated with less state formation and smaller scale political organizations. So maybe, we've not run it, maybe if we ran this model in Africa, we would find the need to, we would need to incorporate the disease environment as well as, um, as uh, the factors we have in the model. But maybe the factors we have in the model are sufficient, we don't know yet. Uh, similarly, if we looked at the Americas, we, we would find only a few large scale polities emerging like the Incas and the Aztecs. And again, I'm not sure if we have as good a sense of, of how, to, how to fit the model to the data because we, there may be some historical American regimes but we just don't know very much about, we don't know their science. And he's, and, Speaking for myself, and I think for my co-authors as well as for myself, I have some, I, I know a lot about European history. I know something about Asian history, but I have very little knowledge of African or American history. Okay, thanks. Uh, another question asks, how is the case of sub politics like the tributary states or clean states counted in this model? I guess this is uh, especially the case of historical China, right? Because there were there were super many tributary states. Yeah. But yeah, but that's not that's something we have to abstract away from. Mm. Um, we, 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 it's a it's a different question in some sense. Yeah, of course. All right. Well, can another question is can the model fit a succession pattern following something like Mongol unification? Uh, for example, to artificially create a huge unified polity and then see how it fragments. Yeah, so that's something we, the Mongols, again, so that's, there are two, so I said those, the Mongols, we cannot really generate exactly. We can generate states near the steppe, conquering other states in our steppe extension. We can, we give them some military advantage, but the Mongol conquest is so quick that that is something we kind of generate. Like the, the spread of the Mongol Empire across, you know, Russia um, and, and the whole of the Middle, Middle East and then China is something which is, we, we cannot really generate. Um, it's, it's asking a little bit too much, I think, of a simulation. Okay. Then the following question. Uh, are dense forests and agricultural productivity and the population not endogenous? 
yeah, this is the general question about the yeah. endogeneity. Yeah, so so I can see some of the comments as well. So I'll try and answer a few of them. I see Bahina Gupta's question as well. It's about the population. So the idea is is in the most simple sense is that conflict occurs over resources, and so areas which have more resources, we think are more likely to stem into conflict. Now, and the geographical characteristics are so ruggedness is exogenous. Presence of uh, um, the sea lanes, these most geographical features are exogenous. Dense forest is potentially somewhat endogenous. What I will note is the, 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 the measure of forest we have is really the, um, I have to say this the right word, it's, it's, it's only dense forests we're including in our geographical level. And we can take it away and it will not affect things as, as I showed you. But the dense forests of Northern Germany um, was very, very robust to pre-industrial techniques for clearing it. So we, in the, in the actual paper, we document this. So the German, it, it, there, was, there was some forest clearing, but as late as 1700, something like 40% of Northern Germany is still forest because with pre-industrial tools, it's very hard to, to push back. So there's some endogeneity there, we accept, I accept, but it's most of these geographical characteristics are fixed and we need them to be fixed in our model. I understand that there are some things which could change over time. So potentially soil quality could change over time with, with climate, but we don't want to introduce more and more free parameters because that's going to make it easier to fit what we observe. We can, we can explore climate change and some of these changes, I think, as an extension. But in our baseline, I think it's more rigorous to keep a lot of these things geographically fixed. Uh, Bishina Gupta's question is that why would why would cells with larger populations and more productive land want to conquer less productive land? Um, but which is which is a fair enough point. Again, we we are not model. We cannot model the strategic decision to go to war. What we think, and I think this is right historically, is historically you get small scale conflict erupting over resources all, all the time. So in in a Roman period. We see it's true the barbarians might want to attack the Roman land, but the conflict that the barbarian, if the barbarians fight over a, over a border, that then brings in a, a large scale conflict in which the Romans may want to annex the, the barbarian territory, but they may not be able to keep it because it's too rugged. So I, I actually think the argument I've, I've laid out fits what we know about prehistorical conflict with the caveat that in a for different questions, obviously we would want a model which is strategic, but a model in which conflict is strategic, where you're making your modeling, do I want to conquer this regime or not? Do I want to annex this land? What are the costs and benefits? That's a different model. That model cannot be applied to this large scale question. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot compute a model with strategic decisions and have the richness of our model. So I appreciate the comment, but I think it's a different, we could write another paper and it would be a paper about the expansion of empires in which the conquest was strategic. Okay, thanks. So this question uh, comes from Professor uh, Bushnaria Gupta and Warwick. Uh, I don't understand the economic argument of expansion of politics. Productivity in your framework is given by population. Large populations have more capacity to win a battle. Why would the larger populations, populations in more productive land want to expand into less productive land? Smaller populations in lower productivity land may want to take over more productive, productive land, but do not have the military capacity. I, so thanks, Christian. I, I, was, I was trying to speak to that question just now, actually, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and answer, I'll answer again. So I think the way conflict works in, in the ancient world is, is that you have conf, conflict erupts over a border. So for example, in the second century, Germans were raiding the Roman Empire. Um, and then the response of that, brought, that brings about a, a border conflict. And then the response of the Romans under Marcus Aurelius is to actually expand into Germany to, to suppress these raids and to fight them. And they want to, they, they think about conquering Northern Germany 
Um, and they try to for a few years, but eventually they, 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 they don't. So in some sense, you can model that as a secession because of the ruggedness of a terrain and the forest, the forest density. So what I'm saying is that conflict is more likely to arise on a, on a border where there's more to be fought over. That's the assumption. Um, what we do not have is the strategic decision that if we're in a productive, we, if we're a large population of productive land, we might not want to conquer this land, right? It's not worth it for us. That strategic decision is not going to be in a model and in some sense requires a very different type of model. Okay. So I really want you to have a break because so many questions. <laughs> so I, I will continue to pick up for you. Uh, Well, this question is, I'm interested, I'm interested in the way the type of grid used affects the results. For example, if triangle is used, there are less likelihood of conflict, and this yeah. may affect the trend of the unification. Yeah, is that that's, right? yeah. That's, that's right. We use squares. In our, so our original simulations actually were square grids, okay? And so now we've done hexagons. Why hexagons? I think, and, and obviously triangles will be, will be less conflict for sure. But we would just, that, it doesn't matter basically in the, in the sense that if we had triangles, we would, we would have to, to fit the data. I suspect, we not, we've not run it. I suspect we would adjust the other parameters and we would still get the same results. Um, but hexagons are the best. Okay, because if you think about the world, think about a tribe in, in the Iron Age, a very small scale society, they have a village, they have a chief, their political authority extends out as a, in a, as a circle, actually, you would think. Naturally, the natural way to think about political authority is it's expanding out as a circle. But you can't map circles onto the, onto the world because when the circles touch, they're going to leave some areas uncovered. And so the closest um, to a circle is a hexagon. So the hexagon is the mathematically correct way, I think, to model, model this. Um, but nothing in our results depends on the hexagons. You can have, we've done squares, and I think you could do triangles. We would just have to adjust the parameters. Alpha would have to be a little bit higher, probably. Okay. This question uh, may come from a fan or friend of you. Uh, Hey Mark, fascinating project. You just finished a book on religion. Can you comment on the fragmentation in Central Europe after 1500? How should one balance the variable of religion vis a vis the geographic ones you just spoke of? Yeah, it's a great <clears throat> question, but it's also one which is very difficult to, um, to answer. Um, so, um, it's in, so from this model's perspective, we don't want to introduce another free parameter. So like the more parameters you have, the more you can, the more you can, do, more you can do model fitting. So we don't want to ad hoc add a parameter like religion, but clearly it matters for state formation. The question is, is, is religion endogenous to state formation? So do you think that when you get a large empire, uh, you then generate a religion which justifies empire, right? It makes empire more easy, or an ideology, right? So, that, so you, people in, in Chinese kind of um, East Asian history or Chinese history, people say that because China has been in an empire for a long time, they may generate the ideology that it's good that China is unified, or it could be that there's the ideology that it's good that China is unified, which generate helps to generate the, um, the the state formation in China. So they're endogenous, and um, so we just abstracted away from it. Uh, in our, but I would, to go back to my book and to go back to that great question, in Europe, um, after 1500, the fact that it's religiously fragmented is like an additional reason keeping the states apart, right? So it's like some, something changes ideologically after a reformation, which makes it harder for the Germans and the Italians to be members of the same state, like we had been during the, the Holy Roman em periods of the Holy Roman Empire. But was that change endogenous? Uh, maybe, maybe it was. So actually, I would direct you to Walter Schiedel's book because he discusses some of these factors. He argues whether religion was one of the reasons which, which, which increased fragmentation, and it probably was. Uh, final point on that, even before the Reformation, the fact that you have the Catholic Church being so important in Europe 
is always a factor against political unification in Europe because whenever the emperor, the Holy Roman Emperor or the French king is too strong, the Pope has an, he's going to like try to control the papacy and the Pope has an incentive to ally with other kingdoms against that strong ruler. So the Pope in the Middle Ages is a check on European centralization. Even in the 16th century under the Habsburg, the papacy will ally against the Habsburgs sometimes um, to mo moderate the power of the Habsburgs. Now you could say, why is the Pope able to do this? Why is the Catholic Church able to do that? Well, that could be a function of earlier political fragmentation. The fact there's no European empire means <clears throat> the papacy becomes more powerful. So these questions are fascinating, but they're very complicated. That's why they're not in this model. Yeah, I just want to add, maybe the religion uh, could be a, an outcome variable of mm. the fragmentation of faction left. Yeah. Because you know, in, in, in the long history of Imperial China, uh, the Confucianism was persistently promoted as, as the state religion or state orthodoxy. However, in Europe, there was no such a powerful and stronger state uh, uh, religion. In, in most part of the history, right? Yeah. Exactly, exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, so maybe the last question, I, I think you, you, you need a break. Uh, well, uh, in history, the winner in China sometimes were not the controller of the central plane. Uh, like those occupying Sichuan and uh, Shanxi province in west or southwestern China. May I ask, have you considered any explanation on this, like the difference between conquering and uh, maintaining the rule? So, um, I'd have to like look at the history myself. You can have in our simulations some regimes in southern China, right? You can get regimes which, you know, maybe resemble some historical regimes in southern China, but in our simulation, they will never unify all of China, okay? And based on the, the kind of the, the dynastic table we have, that's the case historically in the sense that no regime from Sichuan, as far as I'm aware, conquered all of China. So to, to, to be strong enough to unify the entire Chinese empire, you need to have control of the Northern Plain most of the time. The Ming are the uh, potential of the exception, maybe the lower Yangtze Delta. Um, but you can, there's enough resources in Southern China to maintain states, right? And the other fact about Southern China is it's rugged. So Sichuan is rugged, so it's hard to conquer. So if you look at various iterations of a simulation, you're going to see iterations where for some periods of time, you can have robust medium-sized states in Southern China. It's just eventually they get conquered by the, by the North, eventually. Okay, so Professor Chen, do you have any additional comments? Oh, no, no, good for me. Mm. Okay, so uh, how about we stop here? Yeah, well, maybe uh, just uh, one. Uh, well, thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you, James. Uh, let me make one final announcement. Uh, a week from today, uh, we will have uh, Stephen Broadbury uh, to speak on accounting for. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, here it is. Accounting for the Great Divergence: Recent Findings from Historical National Accounting. Okay, so, so that will be. Uh, at 9 a.m. London time next Thursday and Hong Kong time uh, 4 p.m. Uh, next Thursday afternoon. So that will be a regular uh, quantitative history webinar series. Uh, it will be conducted in uh, English as well. Uh, in fact, after next week, uh, two weeks from today, we will have uh, Ron Harris, uh, a um, legal history uh, historian uh, at the University of Tel Aviv. He's going to speak on uh, his uh, latest book, uh, Go in the Distance, uh, the uh, historical roots of uh, the, uh, you know, a limited liability corporation as a modern uh, organization, uh, organizational form of business. Okay, so that's uh, enough uh, advertising from me. Uh, thank you again for joining this uh, special webinar together with 
um, uh, James and uh, his group. Uh, all right. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, again. Thank you so much for having me. I really thank enjoyed you, it. Thank you, James. James. Bye now. Okay, bye.